Nine experienced hikers set out on what should have been a routine expedition into the Ural Mountains, never to return. They would meet their end under circumstances so mysterious that decades later, investigators are completely environment. So this kind of trip was just nothing new to them. And the group was led by a 23 year old named Igor Dyatlov, who the Dyatlov Pass is named after. So his team is a mix of enthusiastic young people around the same age. And I'm going to try and run through briefly who each one of them was and introduce them. So of the other eight, besides Igor, you have Yuri Doroshenko. This fearless explorer is always willing to push the limits and known for his fearlessness and bravery. Next, you have Zanadia Komogorova, tough and spirited hiker with an avid love for the outdoors. Ludmila Dubina, who's said to be a passionate and determined young woman. Rustam Slobodan, the athletic and resilient trekker whose endurance was said to match his resolve. And then you have the joker of the group, Yuri Krivonoshenko. And let's not forget the quiet intellectual, Alexander Kolvatov. And then we got our mixed bag, the level-headed and experienced hiker, Nikolai Thibault Brignolis. And then, lastly, the older, wiser, Semyon Zoltarov, whose presence adds a layer of intrigue to the group. So the group itself had actually prepared for months for this journey, and they basically spent time training, gathering supplies, and mapping out their entire route through the Ural Mountains. The group did know that this was going to be a very challenging trek, and it was going to push the limits of their kind of experience and physical fitness. Now, that doesn't mean that they weren't capable of doing this trek. It just means that this was at the upper ends of difficulty. I think it was classed as a category three trek into those mountains, which is supposedly the most difficult. And the Siberian winter is no joke up there. Seriously, like I know like Russian people are born hard and bred for the weather, like probably some of the Nordics and Canadians, but yeah, we're still hairless primates and, and minus 25, 30, we're no match for that without all kinds of specialized equipment. So the trek that was originally planned after like months of preparing was supposed to take two to three weeks. The diet of group would set out on January 27, 1959, and were expected basically to check in by telegram around February 12th. So this was, like I said, no ordinary trek. It was going to be difficult. And the route that they were taking, it was going to take them to a place called Ortenen which is a mountain whose name is indigenous and named basically by the local Mansi people. And it translates to don't go there. Now, if that isn't an ominous and foreboding message before you leave, I don't know what it is. So they set out from basically this small town called Sverdolsk. And yeah, like the first couple days of the trek were somewhat uneventful. They are using a combination of skis and hiking. They move at quite a good pace through the snow covered mountains like on cross country skiing you can cover ooh, 10 miles in a day which doesn't seem like a ton but it's a ton in the mountains in the snow and it would be an incredible feat to move that amount of distance like seriously if you've never walked in deep snow or like winter conditions i've been stuck before and had to actually like walk on waist deep snow on this lake where my transportation was completely bogged down and stuck and no use and making the rookie mistake of actually forgetting my snowshoes that day like oh my god so myself and another fella uh, who was much better shaped than me but like i had to walk we had to walk back and it was about minus 30. the crazy part is the heated cabin was maybe two kilometers to three kilometers away and whether you're one, two, three kilometers or 10 feet, it doesn't matter unless you're able to get inside and into the heat. Even seeing the cabin, it's still looking an entire day. Literally, from morning until almost later towards dinner time, like getting dark, to struggle my way back to the heated cabin. And I remember like laughing at one point, thinking like, shit, I could die here within view of, hey, my heated cabin's right fucking there, and it's it might as well be on Mars. Luckily, through a little bit of trail breaking and stuff, we made it back. And yeah, we'll move on. So just, yeah, that's the point I'm trying to say is that like moving around on these kind of areas in the winter is near impossible and humans are not built for it. So the group 
is documenting the progress through the mountains in a series of diaries and photographs and basically capturing moments throughout the entire trip. Just in case you're listening on Spotify or somewhere else where you're not able to see the video, check out our YouTube channel. The link's in the description, but basically you can see the pictures and the full kind of like video layout if you're interested in that. We'd love to have you subscribe there. But yeah, so the group moves on documenting this whole thing. And what in the diaries and things is just basically a group with a lot of camaraderie. They're excited. They're happy. And yeah, they're having a good time. But as they venture deeper into the wilderness, the weather does begin to turn against them. The temperatures plummet. And I think it goes down to, again, like nearly a minus 30. But, but the real difficulty starts when the wind kicks up and the blowing snow reduces visibility to basically nothing. Still, they pressed on and they, like, they had this determination to reach that goal. And they decided, hey, like, this is, we're experienced hikers, we're used to adversity, we're going to push on through this. Now, this is just a piece of advice to someone that's, like I said, experienced. 20 years working in not just the wilderness trained in rescue and things like that and survival but you're this is where you want to stop moving on if you find yourself in conditions like this like you can't see properly the wind's kicking up yes you want to get from point a to point b and the idea that you could be stuck out someplace overnight is terrifying awesome this is where things start to go off the rails for groups is pushing it a little too far past that comfort zone. So rather than taking the time to set up base and you make yourself a nice little nest in a safe spot, you find fire, now you're gonna exhaust yourself, possibly to the point of like, you're getting lost, you're gonna be frozen, hypothermic, all these things now. When you finally realize, fuck, like we can't go any further and now we gotta build a shelter and now you're trying to start a fire with your fingers that have frostbite and you can't light matches, your toes are frozen. Maybe your group's been split up. You have to gather firewood. The list goes on. It's just everything happens on an exponential curve in the wilderness, meaning that like bad things go bad very fucking fast. And you can't, you just can't push it. You got to stop. And I, and especially this is like a, you see this a mountain climbers, the adrenaline duck junkies, and a lot of people sometimes it, it's, it's that same spirit of adventure that pushes you over that next hill and to see what's out there can also be that same thing that pushes you a little bit too far. So sometimes you got to learn to check that ego. January 31st. So according to the diaries in the group, this is the point where they reach what's called the Highlands. And they, they would use this spot as a place to store supplies and caches so they could mount some smaller expeditions from there to push further into the mountains and they could recede to this area if needed. And basically what's put together from this is that it looks like the group was intending to dig in a little bit with the plan to start turning around, come back because of the weather. The idea of setting up like the home base is a normal idea. So if you're like a little bit turned around, it may take several days for them to get their bearings. You need clear weather. Like you need to be able to see stars and sun and things like that. So they're probably, yeah, like they're stuck making a little base camp essentially in the Ural mountains that they're in. Again, I don't really need to go on this because it's like I said, the fact that it's in Siberia should tell you enough, but it's fucking cold and it's winter and it's January, which is like literally the coldest time of year. And it's getting dark at 430 in the afternoon. So yeah, like little mini camp was going to allow them to push on a little bit or maybe explore trying to get their bearings in but still have kind of a place to fall back to, which is honestly, it's a good strategy to have in place, especially the whole idea you want a place to call home, but you need that anchor for food and water and warmth. And, and what happens next is a little foggy. There's some blips in the journals and such, but like basically for some reason on the night of February 1st, 1959, the group decides to move their camp basically to the exposed slopes of a mountain called Colat Sikl. And it's perplexing as to why they did this, because they're losing the shelter of the forest, the kind of the cover and the wind block, the fuel supply from the wood. And it doesn't make a lot of sense why they would put their camp there. It seems very risky and it makes you wonder, was there something in the woods that chased them up there? Yeah, this is a part that definitely, I would say this is where the mystery really begins to unfold because it... It challenges all logic to set up 
a base to move your camp from a sheltered area up onto an exposed slope in minus 30 weather and not just minus 30 weather like they're having bouts of blowing snow and it's not nice up there and what's even more creepy is that mountain call that seagull actually translates to the name dead mountain jesus talk about the universe sending you signals so that night is basically the the night kind of sets in the temperatures begin to plummet even further and i think it's believed from like the weather temps it was about minus 25 celsius that night which is it's basically completely unsurvivable without shelter of some kind and the group huddles together in their tents surrounded by darkness and the deafening roar of the wind like it would have been loud in the tents so then the next part of this puzzle kind of kicks in and so they're on this slope for whatever reason and then something happens at the campsite complete chaos breaks out the tent itself all of a sudden is slashed from the inside people in the tent undressed with no clothes on decide to get up and start running away from the tent barefoot in that freezing cold temperature the footprints in the snow suggest that like the group basically dispersed in different directions running downwards down the hill basically into like kind of towards the tree line because of the time from when they reported missing later on and like when they're found like they lose the footprints but basically it shows that yeah like essentially the group descends into chaos and runs into the forest without any clothes on all of a sudden in the middle of the night by morning the storm had passed and in this chaos the entire group succumbs to the elements and basically in different locations and freeze to death and it's not just one of them it's all of them this is the point where you start thinking about all the things that happened before leading up to this event like all the preparations made all this stuff i can't stress this enough what made them leave that forest in the first place only to go camp up on this slope to literally run back into the forest clearly terrified in the middle of the night and refused to return to the tent to the point they all froze to death i seriously can't figure it out we're going to continue to move on because there's even more clues and crazier things that happen or are discovered at the scene. But basically, there's a few important things I want you to know before we move on. And it's just, it's related to both the geography and it's related to the conditions at the campsite at the time. So the Ural Mountains, like I said, are in Siberia. Super unforgiving terrain. You have not a lot of daylight, super cold temperatures, known for like high winds, which is really bad when you mix that with the cold and on top of that is extremely remote so like you're getting lost in there you're not getting help the slopes of the mountain where they basically put their tent on that exposed face is specifically known for having like brutal weather patterns and isn't the kind of place that locals or anybody would have ever ventured to go camp and Besides the bad weather and all the other things, like it's very rocky and very steep. So there's a lot of rest, like breaking your legs and just not being able to cross the terrain very easily. And in the types of temperatures that the group would have been basically facing, they, even with proper clothing at minus 25, 30, you can succumb to hypothermia fairly quickly. And as you begin to feel the effects of hypothermia, your physical abilities start to become limited and so do your cognitive. So you basically become dumber. It tends to impair your decision making and it can also affect like your fitness. So you might not be able to have, you might not have the energy to say set up a camp properly or dig yourself in for the night. And in those temperatures, like in that time of day, they probably would have been packing in like canvas style tents, but you, you would need some kind of like oil heat source or super heavy duty sleeping bags so like the gear that these people were taking would have been heavy and a little hard to lug around but you're not surviving in those temperatures outside of your tent for too long you need that heat and the real danger comes in when you sit still so like you might be moving around a minus 30 dressed up you're sweating you're fine you sit down in that sweat that damp that everything like if you don't have a little bit of a heat source you're into hypothermia super super quick really important facts here to keep in mind also later in the episode is that this area is also known for some kind of an anomalous activity basically geomagnetic storms this area for some reason seems to be subjected to a, 
higher than normal amounts of solar activity and solar flares. And some people think that these storms can cause like effects on humans, like hallucinations, things like that. I don't know, it could be true, but that area specifically is noted to be like anomalous for that. The other things is something called the catabatic winds. I'd never heard of these until I researched this case, but the catabatic winds are basically a powerful downward blowing wind that can sweep across the mountain with basically incredible force, overturning tents and disorienting basically anyone in their pass. It can cause a sudden drop in temperature and basically, it's, I think an equivalent would be like a micro burst or some kind of like micro storm where you have a whole downflow of air coming up from a higher area. But this area is known for that and it could have also been part of the reason either why they moved their camp or just completely like disorienting the group and plunging them into conditions they didn't expect. So you have all those facts with the name that like everywhere they step, it's like dead mountain this, dead person that, dead person that, you're going to die, don't go here. They were definitely in for a hard trek. As the days basically passed, the diet of group would fail to check in as expected by telegram. Yeah, like they were supposed to confirm their safe return. And on February 20th, 1959, people have really grown worried that they didn't return and essentially begin to mount a rescue operation, thinking that they could have been injured or stranded. Obviously, in those days, there's no sat phones and things like that. So they're going to go and see if maybe they can find these people. The initial search party was some locals and volunteer students from the university itself who weren't necessarily all that skilled in kind of the backcountry trekking. As they pushed into it, they realized they need more help and turned to the military, which does supply search and rescue helicopters. Once they realized, okay, these people are legit missing, a full skill rescue operation is mounted. And on February 26, six days later, the searchers make a chilling discovery that plunges this entire case into complete mystery. The group's tent is found like, on the slopes, like I had mentioned, half buried in snow, but somehow intact. The campers are not inside. The tent had been slashed. And in a desperate attempt to escape, like people are running around in their underwear. All of the hikers' belongings and clothes, food, you name it, also in the tent. It's if something inside that tent just suddenly happened. Something scary enough to make you run out and might have in your underwear. I can't think of too many things. Maybe somebody let one fucking rip. That was real bad. After a little bit of tuna melts, I don't know what they're eating, to be honest, but that might clear it out. But I don't know. So the searchers right away are seeing this scene, probably thinking it's a crime scene, to be honest. Like when you start seeing slash marks, and this weird like dispersion of effects all over the crime like a crime scene or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, like I'm sure right away they're thinking something bad like that might have happened. But they start to follow the footsteps leading out from the tent and all within a kilometer and a half. Basically they follow the footsteps into that forested area and there's this large cedar tree and beneath that tree they find the first bodies. It was Yuri D and Yuri K lying side by side with no shoes on and completely undressed other than their underwear. So their hands and their feet showed signs of burns and there was remnants of a fire that they had tried to keep going beside them and yeah, basically in a desperate attempt for survival, which even with fire, yeah, minus 30 in that temperature. I'm sure I'm sitting there like, that's a, how the hell? Why are they there? That, what? Like a kilometer and a half away, in that fucking snow. Okay, there's so many theories and reasons, but we're, I promise we're going to get into that. And I'm excited to actually offer you some new insights on this because I think there's some things that have been missed along the way. But further up the slope, the searchers continue and they find the bodies in Zanadia and Rustum. It looked from what the investigators can put together that they had been trying to make it like walk a little bit back towards the tent before they ended up succumbing to their injuries. Slobodin had a small crack in his skull and a head injury, but it's later noted that this wouldn't have caused uh, kind of like a fatal or any serious injury to him. It was like a micro crack. And again, with these people, they're not wearing their clothes. Yeah, five of the people are found initially and oh fuck, it doesn't get more normal from there, guys, seriously. It's not until May of that year, like after an extended search and months later, that 
Lyudmila, Alexander, and Nikolai and Semyon are found. And when they're finally found, they were, it's known that they were actually buried four feet under the snow and about 75 meters further than anyone else in the group into the woods. All of these hikers were better dressed than the others, and some of them were wearing clothes that were taken off of their deceased companions. Yeah, disturbing. What the fuck is going on here? I, like, seriously. Nikolai is said to also have suffered from fatal skull fractures. Ludmilla and are both said to have suffered from severe chest injuries, typically associated with the violent force of a car crash. But Ludmila, oh man, she is found both missing an eye and missing her tongue. A gruesome detail that adds another horrific layer to this already super confusing mystery. So despite all of these super friggin' complex, like super traumatic, physical injuries across the group. There's not a single sign of external trauma to us. One of them. We're talking no signs of struggles, no defensive wounds, no cuts, no bruises, nothing that could essentially explain the trauma that they were put into. It was like something did it from inside their bodies. Yeah. So just to summarize what happened before we move on again, so there's no confusion. Actually, I'm going to say it's all confusing. The group leaves safety to camp on an exposed slope during a storm. For some reason, completely unbeknownst to us, the group cuts a hole in the tent and exits it in haste in the middle of the night. Only some of the members are actually, essentially, some of the members are like partially dressed. Everyone runs out. For some reason, you end up having the entire group scatter away from their safety in their tent, seeming like they might have got lost in the forest or something. And at some point during the night, like they're starting to drop off and die. And like you actually have people in the group taking clothes from other people. So meaning that they're interacting, but then for some reason, they all split up again. And you have some group found buried in the snow months later. You have one group found in a different area seeming to walk up. Two guys sitting by the fire who still died, cuddled up, and no explanation as to how any single one of them actually got these horrific injuries. Yeah, like I talk about fucking confusing. Man, I got a headache just thinking about it. Anyhow, this is what we're going to try and peel apart. So I just want to say thanks to everyone who's joining us again today. And if you're finding this story as compelling and as compelling as I do, seriously, jump in the comment section today and I'd love to know your opinions. But please don't forget to hit subscribe and like on this video. I could really use your support. The biggest thing I need to lean on people right now is I need you to tell people about the show. It the only method I have of getting the word out there is you guys. And yeah, thank you. You guys are the will be the number one reason that this thing grows. And I really appreciate that. Okay, so as you can imagine, as the years pass, investigators try to piece this together. Forensic experts are from all over the globe. You name it. Armchair detectives and all kinds of theories begin to pop up as to what could have caused the tragedy at the Diablo Pass, essentially and the loss of those nine lives all right we're gonna get into some of the theories it's crazy one of the things i was gonna say is like the initial finding that crime scene uh, i don't know if you've ever heard of the lake boda murders or not but this really rang or sang to me when like the way they found that crime scene with the hacked open tent and like literal chaos everywhere yeah if you want to see that like story it's a horrific story but it's the links in the video here but it was one of the it offered a lot more explanation than what we have in this case it, it's more akin to a serial killer and this is more akin to something possibly supernatural so the first theory that's i think a lot of people jump to and so yeah like it makes sense when you start thinking about the totality of the circumstances is that during the night the group essentially set up their camp on a more unstable slope than they realized and that at some point, a slab of snow is triggered. Essentially, like an avalanche is triggered. And a large slab of snow begins to slide. And the group kind of panics, thinking like, holy shit, we got to get out of here. The force of the snow collapsing on their tent would have been like 
getting hit by a freight train, essentially, in their mind. Like, it would have been pretty scary. And they slash their way out of the tent and basically try to get the out of there before they're buried in snow. In their desperation, they run down the hill, trying to get away from this avalanche, trying to stay together, but get separated. They receive injuries and essentially they're unable to find their way back to the tent in the dark and the chaos and succumb to the injuries despite China trying to survive out there. But a lot of people push back on this theory and they don't think it's true and there's quite a few reasons. The first being that the search team when they searched the area said that there was no evidence of an avalanche. There was no broken branches, disturbed debris, rocks and things kicked up and the tent itself was still standing. It was partially buried in snow, but not crushed as if like the snow slid on top of it. And the snowpack itself that kind of surrounded the area as they investigated it, it was so that it didn't have the stratification and layering that would have indicated any recent movement. And basically, if there was an avalanche, there would have been a lot more evidence in the area of it. That doesn't mean that they couldn't have thought that there was going to be an avalanche. That's something we just can't can't speculate on really i guess we just, we'll never know but furthermore the types of injuries that the group received don't align with those typically seen in an avalanche avalanches result in a lot of blunt force trauma with extensive external injuries due to violent force of rapidly moving snow and debris victims are found with basically multiple fractures abrasions external bruising in contrast the people at Dyat love pass suffered extreme injuries in some cases such as rib fractures and skull fractures there was no corresponding external trauma such as cuts and bruises on the skin now i want to weigh on this part specifically and as why i'm very skeptical of an avalanche theory cold snow in minus 30 is so cold believe it or not winter roads used in logging they will hack it with hard snow because the minus 30, that ice and that snow basically has the traction in the grip of like sandpaper. Cold, freezing, stratified snow is basically billions of tiny million ice crystals. That's like a bunch of glass. So there's this thing, it's like a snow rash. Like it's not like powder snow, but if like you fall into kind of like that crusty snow itself, you're not wearing clothes you're gonna be full of cuts and bruises. There's no way you survive that without being completely like scratched up. Like just, if it's minus 25, 30 out, seriously, go run your arm through the snow and like punch into it or do whatever. Like you'll see, you'll get all these like tiny micro abrasions and cuts all over. It is like glass when it gets frozen. So yeah, like those temperatures, the fact that they're not wearing clothes, it would have been very evident if they were essentially caught in any kind of snowpack. And it even boggles my mind. Like you would have got injuries just from running around in those temperatures and that snow. So yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Like how they could have those, like, why wouldn't you see evidence of it? I don't know. The one thing that, I mean, I thought of is like, what if it happened post-mortem? But I'm fairly certain that would have been caught by the examiners, but I don't know. I wasn't there. The people like doctors that have examined this have said that the injuries, the way that their chest injuries were received and those the couple that got them there was something that would be associated with more diffuse pressure and not something to typically, like I said, associate with avalanches. So yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting. The thing about the high impact injuries is really boggles my mind how the chest injuries are not consistent with the kind of diffuse exertion that a avalanche puts on the body so it's like this different kind of pressure and injury so this was like more of a car crash they're saying something like high speed high impact crushing their chest well well i don't know but it doesn't end there because when we don't have answers we turn to all kinds of stuff and actually there's a very interesting one that i'm going to really shed some light on at the end and it's more related to psychological factors with survival and things like that all right so the first thing is this one's interesting because i'd actually not heard a lot about this technology but it explores the use of infrasound weapons essentially and explores the possibility of infrasound energy created by wind and right, what is that? Let's get into it. So the hikers may have been 
victim to something called a Carmen Vortex Sheet. And this is when strong winds flow over very rugged mountain terrain. And essentially, they begin to create something called an infrasound, which is low frequency sound waves that are inaudible to the human ear, but capable of inducing intense feelings of panic, unease, and even irrational fear. So if you ever heard of things like Havana syndrome or like the use of like government weapons that can produce infrasound, but basically the idea being is that, yeah, like it's a sound weapon that you can disable your enemies with, but apparently in the right conditions in nature, wind can do that to you. Wow. That's something else to be scared of. Infrasound waves that could have been generated by the wind could have created this confusion, anxiety, panic, fear in the dead of the night and you have a storm raging outside, everyone fucking freaks out and they run off basically into the wilderness because this phenomenon's messing with their brain. It could explain why they don't bother to grab their gear, why like clearly there seems to be like enough chaos to completely disorient them to the point they don't even make it back to their tent. However, again, like the avalanche theory, there's a lot of skeptics that don't believe it is possible. One, the whole Havana syndrome infrasound weapon thing is like still a little bit controversial. Not to me though, I think it's real. So the Carmen Vortex, like I mentioned before, this is more, so this is related to that catabatic wind that I mentioned earlier that can create. So you have this like down pressure, you have the rough terrain and yeah, like essentially this mix at the right, in the right conditions, creating infrasound to the point where it causes complete chaos, fear, and panic in the human brain. For humans to have, for it to have effects on humans, it's got to be a frequency in the range of 0.1 to 20 kilohertz. And you wouldn't even be able to hear it. That's the funny thing. So you'd have no idea why you're getting all these kind of issues. And for it to actually happen, like it's said that the Ural Mountains would need to generate a consistent and strong enough infrasound frequency to affect the hikers, which people don't think is possible because the weather patterns and the winds don't typically sustain there. So it's not like it could have happened for a very short burst of time, but it's not something that would have been sustained enough to really fuck with them, if that makes sense. And even though that the Corman, the Carmen Vortex Street can produce infrasound, there's not a ton of like verified scientific evidence to support this theory, basically. I think the thing to me that's a critical point that says that it probably wasn't this is that when you look at like the use of infrasound weapons or anything that interacts with the human brain, like drugs, anything, the fact that all nine people had the same reaction, that... That makes me wonder how it could affect all nine of them equally. And because the studies and the, the military stuff that is out there on these things is like, for some people, it doesn't really bother them. They're going to get a little bit of discomfort. Whereas like some people might be like full on throwing up, thinking they have the flu, having like health issues, the whole deal. And often it's not like the effects take a little bit of time. So it's not something that you can just use on somebody like that. And when you have that mix, like the fact that they probably didn't have sustained like wind speeds able to create that like constant humming tone to fuck with you, it seems unlikely. And even in the studies where they have done use infrasound, for a sound, like the amount of people that actually experience fear and confusion is small. Like I said, most people get mild discomfort. It's more annoying than it is funny. It's like Corey Feldman, funny and annoying. I've been watching his fucking clips from his that Loserville tour that the guy's doing around the country, watching him pretend to play guitar and stuff. Oh, man. Oh, man. Seriously, guys, that's going to be me if you don't tell people about my podcast. I will burn up into nothing. I will be pretending to play guitar for likes on TikTok. I don't want that. No, I'm just kidding. I do have some backup skills here. <laughs> I'm fucking breakdancing. I'm a fucking breakdancer. Did you see that Australian breakdancing? Oh, God, that was good. Seriously, my favorite part about this is that they're letting disabled people in the regular Olympics instead of just the special Olympics now. There's been a lot of drama in the Olympics this year. Seriously, he had, I don't know if that guy was a girl or the girl was a guy, the boxer. Yeah, like a lot of drama in the Olympics this year. What should be an Olympic sport? What should fucking be an Olympic sport? Seriously, is disinformation. Could you imagine that? I know the US would be up there. The real trick is figuring out who actually won and what brand of bugs to eat. Okay, so this is another thing. This is an interesting one to pop up and 
So this is happening in the 1950s, and there is a lot of ramped up military, a lot of ramped up military kind of activity post-World War II. A lot of crazy tech getting studied, a lot of crazy drugs. But that's one of the theories we're going to get into it towards the end. Military, militaries around the world at that time, not just Russia, not just the U.S., all experimenting with the next big weapon. They'd seen the effects that in Japan of dropping kind of fat man on little boy and everybody was in this mad race of technology and space and lasers and God knows what. Ways to fuck with the brain, basically. And one of the things that's mentioned is that the injuries found on the people with the crushed ribs and fractured skulls seem to be consistent with something called shockwave damage. And this is essentially damage from a faraway explosion or impact. Basically, it's that pressure wave that comes like flying at you. It's not so much the debris. It's not so much of this stuff. It's that super fast supersonic air and it liquefies things and liquefies and shatters bones and organs, you name it. So supporters of this theory are saying that during, so some of the compelling evidence of this is that actually right around that time, there was kind of UFO sightings. There were strange lights seen in the sky around that, the incident. And there was multiple witnesses saying they saw bright glowing orbs and bright fast moving objects. Some people think that there could have possibly a military aircraft or missile tests going on in that area, in that region during the 1950s. Completely plausible, completely for sure plausible in that area. It was happening. One of the things, one of the technologies that specifically is mentioned is the test of something called parachute mines. And these are devices dropped from an aircraft at altitude and they can be programmed to essentially detonate at whatever altitude you want them to. So they don't necessarily hit the ground. They would be great for starting avalanches, also creating shockwaves. And shockwaves from these detonations could explain the potential injuries experienced by the hikers and particularly like the crush, the crushing injuries. Now, this also would have been something, of course, like that makes sense that you'd be freaking the fuck out and getting out of your tent if all these explosions are going on or going off around you. And one of the things that is found later in the testing of the clothes is there was evidence of small radioactive substances. And people linked this to the possibility that there was some kind of radioactive material in the devices or the, what do you call it, grenades, whatever those bomb guys were. The blowy blowies. And anyway, so there could have been some kind of covert military testing going on. And that upon, like, discovery of this, the campers being dead and all this shit, like, the military is then engaged in an active cover-up of saying, we don't want this technology, whatever the fuck they were up to, to get out. So they, whether they mess with the, the scene itself or just suppress information, all of it's possible. Maybe, like I said, it's 2024, folks, and this is the different disinformation Olympics. And that's a fact. That's a fact. I'm telling you, I'm your friend. Everyone else is lying to you. So the Soviet authorities who did the investigation are said to have like really pushed for it to be closed and the files were classified essentially saying that secret information is present and don't ask any more questions the official cause of death ends up being listed as a compelling natural force super vague super unsatisfactory explanation but this is the thing that leads a lot of people like i said think that the military was involved how again the soviets during that time period especially after world war ii i just finished reading the gulag archipelago i gotta do it again because i'm actually gonna be doing a whole series seriously on on like the european families and the gulags because it's it's insane it's insane that history the russian the soviets in that time like besides having national pride the fact that there is no failure on anything every project is a success everything government does is the best and and even cases like this where you have 
university students wandering off into the wilderness and dying. Like just the fact that you had people that were privileged enough to go and do a trek like this and go to university. That's, that's something that could be seen by the Russian government is luxurious. And you know, you're living in excess and it just might be like something seriously that alone is enough in that period of time series for the Russian military, for the Russian or the Soviets to basically classify anything around anything that happened. So just the fact that they don't want other people in the Soviet Union to hear about college kids going out hiking, because that's that, that show is not only like maybe the fact that these kids died, the lack of being able to figure out the answers in the case, but also just the fact that there was people engaging in what some might call trickler, basically having fun. That's excess. That's living beyond the communism that was like, okay, in those days. And sometimes I wasn't always viewed as like, some there are information that they would want out there. So the information control is real and the motives behind why it could be suppressed by their government. Like I say, is it could literally be any in those days. Like I read stories of the way things went down some of those like revolutions and that and like the serfdom and the ways the, the way the motherland basically had to control information in the lengths they go to to do that is in the cold world war type cold war type period is yeah it's interesting yeah so given all that i don't think that the military blew these guys up i just don't but it's possible it's possible and all right before we get into you what really happened, and I can see that because everything's disinformation, right? But before we get into that, we're going to talk about supernatural stuff for a moment. And seriously, like, why not in this case? Why can't it be the Yeti? Which is what I would think it is. A giant snow beast primate that ripped through their tent and terrorized the little humans into basically freezing themselves to death. One of the reasons that it actually does seriously come up is that there was the discovery near the site of mysterious footprints that didn't quite make sense and a blurry photograph that was taken by one of the hikers that some people claim shows a large humanoid figure. Could it be that the group stumbled upon some kind of cryptid, something from like outside of this world? If you think of like alien abductions and like the orbs that were in the sky earlier, one well, thing that's been noted with not so much, I want to say mutilations, but like alien abductions more of like UFOs creating injuries on people is that there's shockwaves and radioactive burns. So it does actually line up with kind of the account of maybe an extraterrestrial encounter of some kind, even just enough to scare the shit out of them where they run away down the hill. They're exposed to whatever this radioactive material from the orb is. It may or may not be the case. Often with those settings, there's some also environmental like evidence, like things scorched on the ground sometimes, but it's interesting. It's an interesting theory. It just doesn't seem to, like I've seen some more compelling cases for supernatural stuff. I don't think it's the case in this one. I will say that mysterious footprints, if you look at how animals go run around the snow, it's confusing to identify the footprints in deep snow. Moose, for example, running through two or three foot snow all is like a certain pattern of holes in the top of the snow see the footprint it's like way down there right and often the ground is frozen so they're not actually leaving a footprint and typical methods of identifying animal footprints in the snow can be different than that in like terrain or mud would have had to know a little bit about wildlife to make that call maybe somebody didn't and then the blurry picture of the humanoid. I've never seen a not blurry one. So I don't know. So I never considered that like cryptids and aliens and shit are just blurry. Oh, it's always out of focus. It's, like seriously, maybe they're just blurry. Maybe they're low resolution. Like we're 1080p and they're coming in at four pixels. Okay. So the next thing we're going to move forward to is for a little bit of perspective as to what might have happened. But let's look, go through a few really important things that happened during like this case and the environmental factors that may have played into their demise. So first one being that it's minus 25 minus 30. 
And like right away, like the first thought with that, right, is that, well, that's super cold. You're more likely to die. And it's often it's the opposite, actually. And this is the thing that surprised me in this case is typically like you see like a lot of hypothermia the cases of people succumbing to that is in temperatures where you feel a little bit more break. So maybe it's like just a rainy summer day where it's cool or like maybe minus one or two. You're feeling like you don't you can run out into the cold without your stuff. And maybe you don't need a fire or maybe you don't need to take the time to dry off your gear and you start to get hypothermia. It often happens in water submergence, another one. But the fact that it was like minus 25 or 30, right off the bat, it seems so crazy to me because something really bad had to happen for you to leave shelter without your clothes, especially these people were somewhat experienced. And it doesn't matter how experienced you are because nature's telling you to put your fucking coat on. So something scared the shit out of these people. And as they, they would have been exposed to the cold, they weren't necessarily dressed. Well, they weren't dressed good. So not only is hypothermia going to set in very quickly, but physical injury. So like talking frostbite cuts on your skin from the snow, basically dead tissue starting to form all these things probably within minutes. And one of the things that can happen is during hypothermia is you get an increasing amount of cognitive impairment. So you start getting less and less blood flowing to parts of the body not needed to keep you alive. One part, believe it or not, is your brain. Well, not the whole thing, but non-vital functions in it essentially go offline to conserve energy. Basically, your body is starting to shunt blood into its core to keep the heart, liver, and kidneys warm. And it's in this like desperate fight or flight mode to sacrifice certain parts of the body and save others. And as this is happening, slowly your brain shutting down and you're becoming stupider and stupider. In extreme cases, it can actually start to lead to completely irrational behavior. One of the common things that they've seen in certain survival cases is something called paradoxical undressing and essentially your brain and your body are communicating right and you start to feel hot and you're confused you don't necessarily feel like you're drunk you're not knowing what's going on so it's not uncommon for like you're fucking freezing to death and start ripping your clothes off now this makes a lot of sense like you see it I, I think when I say Aaron Rodgers is the case, but I think I have the name wrong. There's a fellow that went missing ice elk hunting and they found his boots and his clothes and stuff taken off nearby. But it's not that uncommon to like start thinking you're hot and you want to take your clothes off. The irrational behavior, very common. Like people walking past like their tent or walking the wrong direction. Even like obvious shelter and stuff is like right there in front of them. So there's cases of people like essentially making it to a cabin and just being too cognitively out of it to actually start the fire after surviving that amount of time. They finally made it to shelter just to let themselves die. Another one that I think of is your limbs and stuff become useless to you. So once hypothermia gets in, you can't even help yourself. So you might not be able to start a fire. You can't have the dexterity in your fingers and your thumbs, especially if you got frostbite on top of that, like to start to strike a match or to even flick a lighter. So it becomes a big issue. Now the problem with this is that in this case, the idea of paradoxical undressing, I don't see it being the case because they all undressed in the tent and all nine of them did. This isn't like a thing that happens with every single person that gets hypothermia and it only happens in a certain stage of it. And it doesn't add up. It explains some of the irrationality properly, but it doesn't explain why they left the tent in the first place and they didn't take their clothes with them. I think one thing that's quite possible that this does happen is groupthink. And I'm going to say that seriously, probably anyone that's camped out in the winter, like these people probably were already, they're probably subsisting during a large part of that trip in low grade hypothermia and probably sleeping at night. Like that night, they would have been experiencing reduced body temperature. You just can't stay warm. And anything happens, maybe one person's in worse hypothermia, maybe one person's not as in worse hypothermia. But whatever, some kind of event clearly happened and you have group thinking. It might not have been a real event. It might have just been someone perceiving like, an oh, fuck, there's an avalanche. Let's get the fuck out of here. Freaks out. Everybody just starts panicking and running. And running downhill 
especially in the winter, you're going to be running and falling and going down like a lot quicker. So you run to the forest and I could imagine what happened next playing into probably what killed them, which is basically a decision that they had to make. A kilometer and a half seems like they're somewhat close to their tent, but a minus 25, 30, they just ran in the middle of the night, undressed, exhausted, the shit beat out of them. Some of them maybe tried to start a fire. Some maybe tried to go back. But the decision on whether or not to go back to the tent at that point was a very hard decision to make. Would have been a very hard decision to make, even for somebody with a lot of survival expertise, because you have supplies and shelter just up the hill, but a kilometer and a half. They end up running in that panic, like far enough away from the tent that it essentially makes the trek back impossible. And what that means is that without clothes and without supplies, that return trip was going to be three kilometers in minus 30 weather without clothes. When they made it to the forest, they were still alive. But what they didn't realize is they were already dead. Only hope could have been possibly to survive in that like huddle together, light a fire, build some kind of snow shelter. Because that's the one thing like those two guys held together building that fire. That might have been like the, the best possible choice in that situation. Like making it back to the tent. Seriously, I can't underestimate it. But the point being is that panicking group, a panicking mindset took over that group. And it could have been literally nothing that caused it. But it just dispersed them in a way. And under the right conditions in that weather, like into an impossible situation. I don't imagine. Seriously, think about yourself running at minus 25 in a panic and you're you're running down the side of a mountain only to get to a point where you look back and I was holy fuck like our tents all the way up there and like i said i've been in a situation where i've been able to see shelter and feel like i could never reach it because the snow is you're exhausted it's deep it's cold and and yeah so yeah this theory is basically yeah like a moment of panic sends these people just spiraling into kind of like their death over anyone that's been time in the wilderness could they could seriously be over something stupid and small like a bird landing on the tent but i think for sure there was a group think element to this of like i said one person panicking and one person everybody running think of the crowd like when there's a shooting now take that same crowd like you're at a concert and gunshots are going off but like you take that same crowd and maybe one guy just hears an engine backfire and he starts running going fucking gun and then it just causes chaos and panic. Yeah, crazy. But there's an interesting thing that I want to get into, which I seriously wonder didn't play an aspect or something didn't play into this. And there's a reason why. One, okay, we've got university kids and it's the 1950s. Kids that are at the age where they're experimenting with sex, drugs. I don't know if rock and roll is quite invented yet, but it was like on the edge. And yeah, like it was a good time. But during World War One and World War Two, one of the things that happens is that so one of the things that was happening is like a ton of military based research on different mind control, medical techniques, you name it during World War Two. It was a crazy time. But one of the things that was happening with the Nazis and we find out like other people during the war is that. They were using drugs like LSD, I think methamphetamine in their soldiers and things like that. And it was just being discovered like the broad range of uses for psychoactive drugs. And it was also the first time that these psychoactive drugs were starting to make their way into kind of the general population. Now in Europe during those times, it was, you could still get it through like medical supplies. It wasn't highly regulated. But it was more a case that these substances were subject subjects of let's say military patents, but there was, it was secretive. So in particular, the use of LSD was really being researched in that time because it was a powerful hallucinogen that can cause auditory hallucinations, dissolution of ego, a distorted sense of time, and basically a completely altered state of consciousness. Militaries were looking at whether it could be used to make people cough up the truth, things like that. And also using things like amphetamines to ramp up the soldiers before battles. So during that time, LSD, their magic mushrooms as God has been around since the start of time. But like one of the things I wonder often is that 
because these were university kids and it was hard to get those kind of substances back in the day, but the one place you would have got it through is actually a university. And it's not like toxicology testing would have been that rampant. Definitely that area of the country was also home to a lot of different mushrooms. They grow in just about every country in the world, and they like psychoactive mushrooms. So I wonder, seriously, if that there wasn't an element of these like college kids going up in the fucking mountains and like tripping balls on probably like shrooms or LSD. And it was something that would never have probably been on the minds of anyone looking for them or investigators. It's not necessarily something that would have been overly evident when the people found them. The idea that you can get into kind of like a mass psychosis groupthink on hallucinogenics is like very valid and it's scientifically proven. It's actually, I think you can become more suggestible and that's the idea. And if for some reason they, it was discovered that like they had got these substances somehow like outside of the fact that they picked it themselves, it definitely would have been covered up. Definitely they would have been because this stuff was being starting to be distributed through universities and stuff at that time, but it was very secretive. So yeah, like it's, I often wonder like this kind of explains to me like, okay, like what, what could have possibly pushed him out of that tent and, and in that way and seriously i think it would have taken drugs i don't see any other like the injuries there's never going to be an explanation that i can think of outside of maybe it happened post-mortem maybe it was from like being pushed up against trees god knows what it, i can't say and the fact like some of the injuries like the person missing the eye and missing their tongue Luckily happened from wildlife. So even in the scariest of scariest of situations, which I think for them would have been probably like an avalanche, it still doesn't make sense that they ran one and a half kilometers into the forest and just waited there to die. Suffering from like terrible injuries with no real concept of how they got there. No real like explanation as to why they left the tent. Why'd they cut a hole in the side? Like, why didn't they just go at the front? time again this like seriously makes me wonder like maybe yeah like maybe they were on something and that kind of makes more sense to me or the group think aspect of like just being like one person panicking and the whole group panicking and to think that this stuff doesn't happen it happens all the time like people panic while they're driving and they end up driving into another car like it's yeah it's possible is it likely i honestly don't know this seriously is a case that's an enigma that I don't think I can solve, but I can say that there's like some things that don't make sense that I've heard elsewhere. I don't see how they wouldn't have been subjected to like tons of cuts from the snow and external injuries. I don't see how they were forced out of their tent without being scared by something that was scary enough to essentially go out into that kind of temperature. I don't think it's impossible for it to happen because like literally from nothing from one person panicking maybe the people are paranoid they're just smoking weed and yeah like they run too far down the mountain and they're falling and getting cut up and the autopsy methods just aren't that great back then and we don't have the best medical records i fully acknowledge that even with the possibility of being on drugs like none of these theories ever really seem to explain the injury sound on the group other than, I wonder if some of them weren't caused post-mortem, so the crushing of the chest and things like that. I'm not a doctor or anything close to that, So I just, but I just wonder if that in the 50s, in especially being in a remote area of the country, not having access to readily available coroners, like a lot of mistakes could have been made. And if the injuries were caused like by an avalanche after they died, or they were caused at the time of the incident and just because of the amount of time that passed they weren't able to figure it out that seems to be more likely than the use of some kind of like secret weapon to melt people's organs what do i know then this is just yeah like a bunch of dudes got fucked up and killed themselves essentially i don't know i'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments is if you think something else happened i like to think usually it's not always the exciting stuff and to me this seems to to point to that uh, I think it's more likely than not that we don't have the good forensic evidence on the injuries because of the time that it was taken. 
I think that if there was any kind of drugs, we'd never know about it. Given the time it was in the Soviets, we don't know a lot of things. I don't think the idea that they were subjected to hypothermia and then as a group were subjected to paradoxical undressing is at all possible. Even the fact that they would have had to basically got hypothermia in the tent and then all decided to do that. And then lastly, it's not clear why the group didn't stay together. Like it seems like whatever chaos happened to the tent didn't necessarily subside when they got to the bottom of the hill. You only have two of them starting a fire, possibly one group trying to return to the tent, and then another group further down that essentially that kind of gets missed by the, sound like they were buried in snow, and essentially missed by the, the search party, which isn't hard that time of year. You get a little bit of snow and freezing the frozen bodies. It's for sure isn't hard to miss that. I think, I think the only explanation, I don't think it's an avalanche. I think the only explanation is something altered their state of mind enough to make them run away from that tent, scared, and essentially hide. And it was probably a false alarm. They, they probably thought it was like an avalanche coming or an animal or God knows what. And once, once they got to that distance away, like it was... They put themselves into a situation where it was too cold. They were too injured and too tired to make it back to their tent without clothes, without stuff. And unfortunately, they would never return home. And this remains one of the most perplexing mysteries. And also one that I want to caution you when you hear other people's theories on the internet. Like seriously, I'm going to tell you right now, most of them make a lot of assumptions. And... I just want to point out the reason I'm so harping on this disinformation stuff is seriously stuff coming out of the 50s from the Soviet Union. I just don't think anyone should be drawing conclusions as to what happened in this case. Speculation, whatever, but I don't think we have all the pieces to this puzzle by any means. Oh, guys, cool thing happening. By the way, August 23rd at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to be trying to do a series of short stories. My first ever YouTube live. It will be interactive. You'll have your chance to add your take on some things. And I'm hoping you can make it there again Friday, the 23rd of August at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Love to see you there. Thanks, guys. And thanks again for joining us. We will see you next week.